Okay, so we're back this morning, and we're talking about the uh, we've been talking about the life of Joseph <clears throat> and comparing Joseph to Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Uh, last week we covered how Joseph was interpreted dreams in prison, and because of that, when Pharaoh dreamed a dream, uh, it was told that Joseph knew how to interpret it, this gift from God he had. So Pharaoh brought him out, and he interpreted his dream. Because of that, we covered how he put him over all the land of Egypt. He was in charge of all the land of Egypt when the famine, well, during the years, seven years of plenty, and then the seven years of famine. God put him, or uh, Pharaoh put him in charge of the whole land. The whole earth had to come to Jesus, I mean to Joseph. And uh, the whole world has to come to Jesus Christ to be saved. Um, but here I want to read in chapter 41 in verse 55 through 57. And says, when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried out to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, go to Joseph. Whatever he says to you, do. And the famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened up all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians. And the famine waxed great in the land of Egypt. And all the countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn, because that the famine of the land was sore in all of the land, all of the earth. And it lasted for seven years. Um, so I, I call the teaching light of the world. You know, this is just compared. Uh, I, I say over and over again how every so many stuff, so much stuff in the Old Testament was almost like a um, a similitude, uh, a comparison to the New Testament. It was almost like a type in a shadow. And here Joseph, I call this light of the world because in Matthew five, I have that written down. Matthew chapter five. Verse 14 through 16 reads, You are light of the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. So let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So God has made us. Jesus himself was the light of the world and he told us that we would be a light of the world because of his spirit in us. And here Joseph was a type of the light of the world. The whole world had to come to him to buy corn. Uh, during these, these seven years of famine. And I believe that compares to the last days that we're going to be coming to. That there'll be some say there's seven years of great tribulation and some teachers believe it's the three and a half last years of great tribulation. Whichever it is, it's going to be, uh, Matthew says it'll be like the world has never seen before. I mean, this world has been through a lot of tribulations in 6,000 years. But the end of the last tribulation will be came and compared to what has already happened. It will be so great. And the whole world will have to come to Christ. But the thing is, Christ is in us. You know, His, his Spirit is in us. Uh, and so the world will have to come to us who have the true light of Jesus Christ, who have the true Holy Spirit in them. And while I'm on this subject, I'm just going to clear up right now uh, about the false rapture teachings that uh, have been taught in the last... I don't know, 20 years or more, and especially the, uh, I don't know if you have if you've watched the uh, shows, the movies, or even the read the books on Left Behind, well, if you have any books on Left Behind, uh, the best thing you can do with that is throw it in your trash can, because, um, you know, the whole teaching of the church, or the true church, the true Christians who have the true light of Christ in them, the true Holy Spirit with all the gifts, this teaching that they're going to be in this last seven years or last three and a half years of great tribulation that the earth will come into, and I believe very soon, and I believe in my lifetime. Um, this teaching is that, this false rapture teaching is that they're going to be raptured out of here, right? Taken away, and um, only those who don't have the true light are going to be here. I mean, you know, the whole point of us being the light of the world is... If there is no light left in the world when these last seven years come, who will the world turn to? And I want to use a few other scriptures to, to just to verify that while we're on Joseph and how the whole world came to him. Because the whole world will be in famine. In Isaiah, in the last days, Isaiah 60, chapter, verse, chapter 60, verse 1 through 3. 
Arise and shine, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. So the darkness famine covered the whole earth of Egypt in that day of, of Joseph. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to your light, and the kings to the brightness of your rising. Okay, I want to also, I'm going to use some scriptures here while we're on this subject of Joseph and the whole world coming to him. If you go to Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, and in chapter 4, and in verses 1 through 3, it says this, there it says for behold the day is coming that shall burn as an oven and we know you know as I think I've um, talked about some scriptures how and in the first end of the world in Noah's day it was by flood in the last days it will be by fire um, the end shall come by fire the day cometh that shall burn as an oven and all they that are proud we talked about the humble and the proud last week all they that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. And it shall not leave neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth, and you shall grow up as a calves in the stall. And you shall tread down the wicked. They shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. In the day that I shall do this, say the Lord of hosts. Now the church is not here on the earth in these last days when that shall burn as an oven. And every every wicked and proud thing will burn up. How can we be walking around and they be ashes under the soles of our feet if we're not here? Also, one more in Psalms. In the book of Psalms in chapter 91 tells us. The very first verse says, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I had to erase something. It jumped up on my computer. Okay. Then, so the important thing is to dwell in the secret place. Dwell in your prayer closet. And in verse 5, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day. You shall not be afraid of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor for the destruction that comes at noonday. A thousand shall fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand. But it shall not come nigh you. Only with your eyes shall you behold, and see the reward of the wicked. So, we're going to be here when all this pestilence and terror that, that, and destruction that comes upon the earth. We'll see thousands fall at our right hand and left, but it shall not come near us. Only with our eyes shall we behold it. So if we're not here, how can we behold it with our eyes? So I just want to clear this up because, you know, this is just a widespread, I mean, probably 90% of uh, evangelical churches believe in the rapture. And it's just a false teaching. Um, we're going to be here for the great tribulation because if we're the light of the world, you know, how in the world, who will they have to come to when they see they've been lied to? You know, who will they have to come to when they see all these gods they believed in and even in the false idols of Christianity that they believe is Jesus himself that they pray to? Uh, yet when this things come upon the earth, they will have no peace, they will have no joy, they will have no confidence that Christ can uh, pull them through it all. They will be fearful like everyone else, and then they will see that their, their Jesus was just an idol. Well, who will they come to except those who have the true Christ in them, the true Spirit of Jesus in them, this true Holy Spirit that gives us the confidence that He's with us, that gives us the power to tread over all these things that happen on the earth and, and walk through it without any fear and have peace. They will see that peace in us and, and we'll be the light of the world in those last days. So going back to Joseph, I just wanted to, 
I thought this was a good time while we're talking about this to clear that point up and to share what I believe that is the truth and the false. But um, even Matthew 24, I think I covered that one time about the last days. One shall be taken, the other left, it says. Days that will be left is those that are righteous that will inherit the earth. The wicked are those that are taken away. Okay, so let's go. So here we go in chapter 42. And I want to read uh, in verses 1 through 4 in Genesis 42. Now when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, Why do you look one upon another? He said, Behold, I have heard there is corn in Egypt. Get you down there and buy for us that we may live and not die. So Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy corn in Egypt. So Jacob sends all ten uh, of his sons except Benjamin. But Benjamin, Joseph's brother, Jacob sent not with his brother. For he said, Lest peradventure something should befall on him, or mischief should befall on him. So he sends the ten sons to Egypt to buy corn. But he doesn't send Benjamin, because Benjamin is Joseph's full brother. And uh, he doesn't want to lose him too. He says, I'm not going to send him. I lost Joseph, and I'm not going to take the chance of losing Benjamin. So, they go down there, and if you want to read the next chapters, that was your homework. And I'm not going to go verse by verse, but I'm just going to touch on exactly what happens. Okay, so the ten brothers come to Joseph and to buy corn. Remember, the whole world is in famine, and they have to come to Joseph to buy corn. Everyone does. So when he comes to them, they come to him. He knows who they are, but they don't recognize him. And he accuses them of being spies. And they say, we're not spies. We're, 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 well, there were 12 of us coming from the land of Canaan, and one of our brothers has died, and the other brother, the youngest, has stayed with our father, and we ten have come to buy food. So Joseph says he wants to test them. He wants to put them through a little torture here, because maybe because of what they did to him. He says, I, I don't believe you. If you want to prove yourself, leave one brother here in prison and go back home and bring the other brother, Benjamin, with you so that I can sh you can prove to me you're not lying. So he gives them food to eat. And he sends them back home, but he leaves one of the brother, I think it was Simeon, in prison. They go back to Jacob with food, and they tell him the story how that that this Pharaoh who they they, they don't know is Joseph, uh, that he sent them back to bring Benjamin to them uh, to prove to them that they weren't lying, and that Simeon stayed behind in prison. Well, Jacob didn't like this at all. He said, I'm not sending Benjamin because I lost Joseph and I'm not going to take a chance of losing Benjamin also. So they they stay where they're at until they run out of food again. He had sent some food with them back. So when they ran out of food again, he says, go back and get more food, Jacob tells him. And uh, one of the sons says, we can't go back. He told us, do not return unless you bring Benjamin. So against his better judgment, Jacob lets Benjamin go. They go back with Benjamin. They come before Joseph again. And so he says, okay, I know you weren't lying now. So he makes a meal for them. They sit down at a great meal that night. The next day he sends them home. All of them, all 11 of them, sends them back with food. But one thing he did, he took a golden cup of Pharaoh. And he hid it in Benjamin's bag and didn't tell anyone. So they're on the way back home. And nobody knows that this golden cup is in Benjamin's bag. So Joseph sends soldiers to, to catch up with him. And they tell him, look, you stole Pharaoh's cup. And they say, we, we don't know what you're talking about. No one here has stolen Pharaoh's cup. And so when they open up all the bags, they found the golden cup in Benjamin's bag. And they didn't know what to think. So they were brought back to, to Joseph. And Joseph says, why have you stolen the cup? And then they began to talk among themselves. Now, you understand, you know, Joseph had learned the language of the Egyptians. And they were talking Hebrew. And he knew, he understood Hebrew language because he was raised as a Hebrew. 
So they didn't know he understood their language. He wasn't talking to them in Hebrew because he didn't want to give himself away. So they started saying how, see, God is punishing us. And he's hearing them say this, you know. Now, you know, we, we, we killed Joseph and now he's punishing us for doing that. And now Benjamin is going to go to prison. And he, and so they try to reason with Joseph saying, look, we can't go back home without Benjamin. He'll kill Jacob. You know, he lost one son and now he'll lose another. And he'll kill him and bring him to his grave. And when Joseph saw their, their repentant heart of what they had did to him and their concern for their father, he broke down and cried and he reveals himself and says, I'm Joseph, your brother. And they all weep. And he says, look, you did this for evil. You did this for evil against me. But God has taken it and turned it into good. Because if they had not done this, Joseph would not be in charge of all the corn. And uh, so God let this happen to actually fulfill the dream. You know, sometimes we don't imagine, you know, we don't realize God is in charge of our life. If we give our life to Him, if not, we're in charge of it. We have to take what comes. But when we surrender our life to God and Jesus Christ and give Him the charge of it, He's going to bring to pass the promises He made to each of us that we would be a light of the world and that He would change us, our nature. The greatest promise is that He would deliver us from our sins Give us the, the spirit that was in Christ, put it in us, and he would transform and change us into the very image and nature that Jesus had. With, with not just the fruits of the spirit, the nature of Christ, but the power that he had also. And that's a promise. And that because of these things, we will be a light of the world. Now he's going to fulfill this promise. If we walk with him daily, he's going to fulfill these promises. But no matter what it looks like, like it did to Joseph, God is in charge and he's going to bring it to pass, which he's doing right now. They all had to come down and bow to, jo to, to, to Joseph like the dreams he had in the beginning. And so, if you go through the whole chapters of 47, 48, 49, and 50, what happens is, um, Joseph sends the brethren back to take all, bring all their wives, all their children, all their flocks of sheep, everything, all their possessions, and to bring <clears throat> Jacob, their father, with them and come and live in the land of Egypt. So that's what they do. They go get them, they come back, they tell them that they have to tell them now the truth about what they did. Uh, that Joseph, Joseph was not dead after all. <clears throat> So they bring Jacob back, and Jacob and Joseph have a great reunion. We, they hug each other and weep. And so they dwell there. And Pharaoh, because Joseph is in such right standing with Pharaoh, that Pharaoh says, you pick the best land, which was the land of Goshen, of Goshen, which was the most fertile land. And, and Pharaoh gave it to Joseph to give to all his brothers so that they could live there and uh, raise their families. And so this is what happens, okay? But we're going to get to Exodus 1. And I'm going to read verse 7 through 14. And I'm going to read it in the Living Bible. Okay. Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1, starting in verse 7. Meanwhile, their descendants were very fertile. And increasing rapidly in numbers. That was the, the Jews, the Hebrews. <clears throat> there was a population explosion. So that they soon became a large nation. And they filled the land of Goshen. Then eventually a new king came along. To the throne of Egypt. Who felt no obligation. To the descendants of Joseph. And he told his people. These Israelites are becoming dangerous to us. Because there are so many of them. Let us figure out a way to put an end to this. If we don't and a war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us and escape out of our country. So the Egyptians made slaves of them and put brutal taskmasters over them to wear them down under heavy burdens while building their cities of Python and Ramses, which were supply centers for the king. But the more the, Egypt, the more the Egyptians mistreated and oppressed them, 
the more the Israelites seemed to multiply. The Egyptians became alarmed and made the Hebrew slavery more bitter still, forcing them to toll long and hard in the fields and to carry heavy loads of mortar and brick. Okay, I'm not going to read any further. We're going to get into the rest of this uh, next week where we actually get into Moses coming along. Okay, and we're going to even compare Moses coming along to Jesus Christ and his disciples. Okay, um, because Moses was a type of deliverer. God sent him to deliver his people out of this bondage and out of slavery. Jesus comes along to deliver us and his people at that time and the Gentiles out of slavery, out of slavery to sin, out of slavery to sickness, out of slavery to the devil and all of the devil's schemes against us. So it's going to be a comparison there next week also when we go into Exodus and Moses. Okay, but so you see here that the population grew and because of this the uh, king, the new king, didn't have, didn't care about the uh, Israelites or Joseph because Joseph uh, ends up dying. I should have read, I think uh, it says further in Exodus. Let's see. Okay, I should I, I go back one verse. I started reading Exodus 1 verse 7 by the children of Israel multiplying and being fruitful. But I forgot to read verse 6. Joseph, and says, And Joseph died and all his brethren and all of that generation. And then the children of Israel began to multiply. So Joseph ended up dying. Jacob, of course, died. Joseph dies and all of his brethren die. So after this, a new king came along and he didn't care about Joseph or, or none of the Israelites. He didn't have any obligation that the first Pharaoh had. <clears throat> so he, they're afraid that they're going to get too large a number and overtake them at one time if a war would break out. So they make them slaves and put really heavy, heavy burdens on them to build their pyramids. And of course, God hears their cry. They want, they want to be delivered and God hears their cry. And um, he's going to send a deliverer. And we're going to get into that part uh, when we get into the rest of Exodus 1, 2, and 3 for next week. So your homework for next week is to read Exodus 1, 2, and 3. Um, but I'm just going to go ahead and go into Exodus uh, 1 a little bit more. And, and we'll cover this into more detail next week. Because I want to compare even all this to the coming of Jesus. But if you read how they made him work even more and more, uh, you know, brutal uh, taskmasters because they were having more, it, was, it wasn't stopping them from having more children, their slavery. So in verse 15, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, instructs the Hebrew midwives to kill all the Hebrew boys as soon as they were born. But to let the girls live. But the midwives who feared God and didn't obey the king, and they let the boys live too. So the king summons them before him and says, Why have you dis disobeyed my commandment and let the baby boys live? Sir, they told him, the Hebrew women have their babies so quickly <clears throat> that we can't get there in time. They are not slow like the Egyptian women. So God blessed the midwives because they were God-fearing women. So the people of Israel continued to multiply and to become a mighty nation. And because the midwives revered God, he gave them children of their own. Then Pharaoh commanded all of his people to throw the men newborn Hebrew babies into the Nile River, where the girls, he said, could live. Okay, so we're going to take up on this next week. So because it wasn't working with the slavery, he tells the midwives who were Hebrews, to kill the baby boys as they were born. And the midwives didn't want to do this, so they lied to uh, Pharaoh and told him that, that the babies were born before they even got there. They, they have such short labors, uh, labors for their babies. So Pharaoh tells his people to throw all the baby boys into the Nile River. And we're going to take up there next week. But uh, one thing was very, very... Uh, I mean, the whole Old and New Testament, I keep saying this over again, but it's such a comparison. Because from the time that Jacob and all the 10, 11 other brothers come to live in Egypt, from the time they come to live in Egypt, 
until the time that Moses is called, which was going to start in Exodus 2 and 3, until the time Moses is called to bring out Israel out of bondage is about 400 years, give or take. So from the time Jacob and brothers come to live there, until the time Moses is raised up to bring them out of slavery, is 400 years. So they were 400 years in slavery. Well, which is so similar is from the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, which I read today, from the last book, of, which was a prophet, from the last prophet, now from Malachi, the last prophet, until Jesus comes on the scene to deliver us out of bondage, of slavery, of sin, is 400 years also. So, I mean, it's just so, so similar. God, there's no accident on the timings of God. He has everything already prepared and planned. The scripture says he has the whole, everything about our own life. Everything about everybody's life has already been predetermined and planned before the world was even created. We don't know what the plan is. The only way we can find out what my plan is or your plan is, is surrender to God and let, ask Him to show you what He created you for. If not, you're going to miss the whole plan of God for your life. But from the time that Jacob came to live there and, and all, the, all the other brothers, until Moses comes along, it's 400 years. From the time that God stopped speaking. See, Malachi, God quit speaking to Israel. The prophets were there to speak to Israel, to tell them to turn from their idolatry. And he stopped speaking in Malachi. He no longer spoke to them because they wouldn't listen. From the Malachi to Jesus coming was also 400 years. So I thought that was very neat. Uh, how God has all the timing the way he wants it. I mean, he's planned it all and nothing's going to change God's plans. And so even uh, God has a set date for the end of, of the world that we know it. And nothing's going to change that date. You know, we can't pray that God slows it down or God speeds it up or God changes the date. It's already been set in stone before the foundations of the world were made. The only thing we can do is ask God to show us how we can prepare if we're going to be alive in those last days. God knows it, but He can show us if, if, if we are to be alive in those days, show me, Lord, how to prepare myself. Well, even as He showed Noah, we covered that teaching, how He told Noah that the end was coming, and He told Noah what to do to prepare for the flood. Well, He can tell us what to do prepare for the end of the world if it's coming in our lifetime which I believe it is um, so next week we're going to get into Exodus 2 and 3 and we're going to talk about Moses coming along and God calling him and to, to deliver his people out of bondage and we will compare this to Jesus Christ and to his disciples that he called so you're the light of the world you know uh, Isaiah 61, darkness is going to cover the whole earth. It's already covering the earth. I mean, this country is in such darkness. Just this country. Don't take the world. I mean, the world's in darkness already. But can it get any darker than it already is? Especially in this country, my goodness. Uh, sin running rampant. Uh, there's no more mor moralities. I mean, you know, half the judges, the Supreme Court, you know, don't care that this country is being taken over by, you know, abortionists and by gay rights. I mean, it's just darkness. How can it get any darker? But your light's going to rise, and the light of the Lord will rise upon you when this darkness and gross darkness shall cover the whole earth. So you're the light of the world. You know, let Him make you the light of the world. But it's only by His Holy Spirit living in us that we can be a light of the world. The Spirit of Christ is the light, not anything in us. So read those uh, uh, next chapters in Exodus, and next week we will take up from here. Well, thank you again for listening.